Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. 1 Thessalonians was written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians living in the city of Thessalonica. This early epistle is written to encourage these believers in their faith and to also help them understand more about the amazing and eternal things of God. Up to this point, Paul commended these believers in numerous ways. He defended himself and he defended his ministry. He expressed his deep love and concern for these Christians in Thessalonica. He encouraged them and then Paul prayed for them. In chapter 4, Paul began to practically show the Thessalonian Christians how they are to live out their faith and how they are to grow in their sanctification. And it was all quite convicting. Anybody? Very convicting. But it's our call to keep growing in the faith, to keep fighting sin, and to keep pursuing the things that honor and glorify God. Why? Because love for Him compels us forward. All right, now what? Verse 9, let's look. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. We urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Here in verse 9, we see the question, which is this, what about brotherly love? And this verse marks a transition from Paul's discussion about sexual purity to a Christian's love and to a Christian's work. And please note that we're still within the context of our sanctification, of our command to continue to grow in our walk with the Lord, our command to continue to fiercely battle against the sin that uh, we have to face day by day and to pursue holiness, Christ-likeness, and purity for the glory of God. So Paul transitions and he says, but concerning brotherly love, and this makes it seem that Paul's addressing some specific questions from the Thessalonian Christians. Remember, Paul sent Timothy to Thessalonica because he was eager to find out how they were doing, and Timothy later returned and gave Paul a good report. And it seems that Timothy also had some questions for Paul that the Thessalonian Christians wanted answered by Paul. What about brotherly love? What, what does that look like? How should it show in our lives? How important is it? Paul, can you just please tell us a bit more about this thing called brotherly love? It's very interesting because there are four different Greek words for love in the New Testament. Eros is the word for romantic or passionate love, but the Thessalonian Christians weren't asking about that kind of love. Storge is a word to describe family love, the type of deep and caring love that develops between parents and children, husbands and wives, siblings and other people that you consider to be family. But the Thessalonian Christians weren't asking about that kind of love either. Agape is a word for covenant love, un unconditional love the distinct love that God has for His saved children specifically, and the distinct love that Christians are to display to others as God's love flows through us to those around us. But look, the Thessalonian Christians weren't asking about that kind of love either. Philia is the fourth Greek word in the New Testament for love, and philia describes the love that we have for our close friends, brotherly kind of love. And this is the kind of love that the Thessalonian Christians were asking about specifically. I think they simply wanted more clarity as to how they were supposed to love one another within the body of Christ. And even though they were members uh, of different natural families, look, they were indeed united in Christ and they were all part of the family of God. So, what should brotherly love look like between us? How's that, how's that play out? How, how do we really show brotherly love to one another in the church and as the family of God? Look at Paul's response. He says this, I have no need that I should write to you about this, because God teaches us that we must love one another. Isn't that interesting? I mean, Paul basically is saying, you guys already know the answer to that, so let's move on. That's what he's doing. In other words, you guys are asking uh, th this question, but you're already doing it. 
You're already doing it. Verse 10, indeed, you, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. As we've already seen, uh, this church was already excelling in faith, in hope, and in love. And Paul mentions their abounding love more than once. And yet, look, they still felt the need to ask about how to love one another even more. And that is the way it should be. Never content with good, but always pursuing more for the glory of God. Oh yeah, they could have said, hey, we're the loving church. Paul himself has already said that we are the loving church and they could have rested in that. But instead, they wanted to know how they could love even better. And that's the heart of those who walk well, of those who please God, and of those who grow in their sanctification, as Paul mentions in chapter four. Now look, this gets even more interesting because while they were asking about brotherly love, Paul responds to this by saying, you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. But the interesting thing is that Paul doesn't use the word philia for love here, but he uses the word agape. Why does he do that? I mean, they wanted to know about brotherly love, but Paul says, you yourselves are taught by God to agape love one another. Again, why does he say that? Here's why. I believe, <laughs> because agape love covers philia love. <laughs> In other words, if they are agape love loving one another, then they don't need to worry about philia love loving one another because agape love encompasses philia love. See, now question, what does Paul mean when he says you yourselves are taught by God? The word literally means God taught, and this is the only time that this word is used in the New Testament. So what then is Paul saying? He's saying this. You guys don't need external instruction here, and you don't need external motivation because you have an internal teaching. You are God taught about love. Okay, what then does that mean? Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts, believers' hearts, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And this is something that is true for every Christian. That when we are saved, God's Spirit then comes into our lives and lives in us, and He pours out His divine agape love within our hearts, and that love affects us, that love changes us, that love flows through us and as a natural outflow of being a child of God, of being a, ch a saved child of God. So He teaches us how to love naturally, see. And because we're talking about God's covenant love, his agape love, his godly love, well then, practicing brotherly love isn't really an issue when we're already filled with God's agape love. I hope that makes sense. You might ask, what if we don't practice this love in our lives? Well, if you don't practice that love in your life, then you're not a Christian. Because this love is poured out into the hearts of every true believer, and it should be growing in our lives as we live out our faith. They will know we are Christians by our love, right? He who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. See, note this. Note that love isn't all that God is, right? And John tells us that God is light, and he also tells us that God is spirit. So saying that God is love isn't the only aspect of God's nature, not at all, but it's indeed one very important aspect of God's nature. There's an off-Broadway musical that has a song entitled, Our Love is God. Oh. Please understand, that is not what the Bible teaches. You can't reverse God as love and say love is God. And while love is from God, that is not mean, that does not mean that love is God. It'd be like saying that since John tells us that God is light, therefore light is God. But guess what? Light is not God and neither is love God. See, love doesn't completely describe God, but love does completely, uh, God does completely define love. His nature is loving, and love can never be absent from his being or from any of his actions. See, he's the source and origin of true love. And his children will indeed display this true agape godly love in their lives because it's now who they are as Christians. So they ask, what, what about brotherly love? And Paul says, well, God's love has been poured out in your lives and you guys have already been displaying that agape love to everyone around you. So just keep that up and 
guess what? Brotherly love will take care of itself as you continue to grow in your agape love as the Spirit works more and more in you and as the Spirit works more and more through you. So keep up with the agape love, see? And the filial love will take care of itself. (laughs) What's this agape love that God implants in every true believer that we are then to actively display to those around us? We've talked about this already uh, a few times in Thessalonians. Let's talk about it briefly again. Agape love. Agape love is love of choice. Agape love chooses to love even that which is undeserving of love. Agape love has to do with the mind. See, it's not something, uh, uh, simply an emotion that rises up in our hearts, but it's a principle by which we as Christians deliberately choose to live by. Agape love is a love that loves without changing. Agape love is a self-giving love that gives without demanding or expecting repayment. It's a love that can be given to the unlovable and to the unappealing because it comes from God to us. It's a divine love. It's a selfless love. It's a love that seeks the best for the recipient because of God's love in us through us. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about this love that we should all display in our lives, and it describes a Christian who is patient and kind toward others. How are you doing with that? He won't be envious and he won't be all about himself. He won't be prideful and he won't behave rudely and he won't seek his own wants and his own desires. No, he won't be easily provoked, but he will be gracious and give people the benefit of the doubt. He won't rejoice in iniquity, but he will rejoice in truth. He will bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Why? Because the person, the Christian who loves like this, all Christians should love like this, He gets it because this love's been given to us from God because this person is saved and and loves his Lord first and foremost because he wants to glorify his good God and follow the example of Christ. That's why we love this way. What then does this love practically look like? It looks like Christ, right? Selfless, sacrificial, kind, other-focused, gentle, humble, caring, forgiving, It's all very practical. How about this? Not gossiping about others. How about this? Forgiving those who have wronged you. How about this? Not striking back or retaliate when you've been hurt. Turning the other cheek, serving, helping, putting others ahead of yourself, and so on. Again, it's all very practical, this agape love thing. Be nice. Be kind. Be gracious. Think the best, not the worst. Agape love asks, how can I show you the love of Jesus clearly? How can I show this love to those around me? And it does it. Here's a question. What are you known by? Does godly love mark your life in growing measure? Some people are known for their meanness. Some are known for their anger, their brashness, their coldness, their defensiveness, their hardness. How sad is that? We in Christ are called to be known for our agape love. Here, Paul is comforted to know that not only were his readers taught to love by God, but also that they have a strong track record of brotherly love towards those throughout all of Macedonia, verse 10. Now remember, Thessalonica was the leading city in the region of Macedonia, And the Thessalonian Christians had frequent contact with merchants and farmers and traders and so on in the region. And look, not only did they spread the good news of Christ to everyone that was around them, but they also were known by their godly love by their brethren throughout that entire region. And how good is that? To be known for something like that. See, everyone knew that the Thessalonian Christians loved God and everyone knew that they loved others. I mean, it was clear. And it wasn't a sappy kind of love. It was a godly love, a gracious love, a forgiving love, a sacrificial love, a servant-hearted love, a Christ-like love that couldn't be ignored, uh, couldn't be denied. It it, it stood out. It's different, right? Oh, that we would be known for our love, never compromising our convictions. No, for love would never do that. But that everything we do would be backed by our love for God and by our love for others, clearly, passionately, passionately emphatically. God teaches us that we must love one another. 
What else? Six more commands for the growing Christian who desires to lead a sanctified life, which is God's desire and command for all of us. First, increase more and more, verse 10. In love, yes, of course, but also in every aspect of our Christian lives. Note that Paul urges, encourages, exhorts, encourages, exhorts, and pleads for the Thessalonians to increase more and more. So this isn't just a, a command to obey, which it is. It's not just that, though. It's a heartfelt appeal from someone who understands the importance of doing this for us. The word increase means to exceed, to be in excess, to excel, and to do considerably more than what would have been expected. The picture is of a river that's overflowing out of its banks, and that's how we are to be when it comes to living out our Christian lives, abounding, overflowing, excelling, increasing more and more and more and more. As we've already seen, more is a good word right here. The word means very, very much or to a greater degree. And that's the call here. That's the command. That is the heartfelt appeal from Paul. More for Christ, for God's sake. So good isn't good enough when it comes to our spiritual lives. Good isn't good enough when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. No, more is better. And here, Paul clearly wants other believers to superabound in the things of God, in all the things of God, and in every area of their Christian lives. And that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, that makes sense. Uh, God is worthy of this, of more from those of us who love Him. And there's no greater thing that we could give our hearts to, our lives to, our souls to. And Paul clearly understood that for himself. What matters? What lasts? What can compare to Christ. So this is a call for more, to increase more and more. It's a call for passion in the faith and in the things of God. It's a call for diligence in the Lord, to hard work at holiness and battling against sin. It's a call to daily fighting strenuously against the enemy of our souls. It's a call to never quit, to never be satisfied with where you're at, to never stop seeking the glory of God this side of heaven because you love him and he's worth it. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Paul says this. You not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. In other words, run to win. Run this Christian race to win. Run the race with maximum effort. You'll never regret it when you do. Don't make excuses. Don't settle for mediocrity. Don't throw up your arms and say, well, that's just how I am. Don't do that. No. Keep battling all sin. Don't run half-heartedly. No. Run all out because Christ deserves more from us today. And I don't care where you're at in your walk with the Lord. He deserves more from us. Increasing more and more. Hey, if there's one thing in life to be increasing in, if there's one thing in life to be passionate about, to be zealous for, to be pressing toward, to be excited about, to be toiling in and to be earnestly pursuing, it's the Lord and in glorifying Him. Anyone? Right? I mean, this is truth here. So let's get on with it. He's worthy. Love compels us forward. Lord, help us to increase more and more. Second, lead a quiet life. Say what? Aspire to lead a quiet life. Um, uh, uh, Paul is saying this. Paul, the guy who turned the world upside down. Paul, the troubler. Paul, the guy who started riots everywhere he went. Lead a quiet life, really. Yeah, that's what it says, as much as you can. The word aspire means to strive eagerly for, to seek after, and to be zealous in the pursuit of something of what? Being quiet. So Paul literally says here, seek earnestly to be quiet. And he's urging them to be zealously active in endeavoring to live quiet lives. That's a paradox there, purposely, I believe. And it implies the hard work that it takes to do this in a God-honoring way. What then does it mean? 
Well, the word quiet here certainly doesn't mean to never speak. Uh, But the word speaks of not intruding into the lives of other people, especially brothers and sisters in the faith, so that you become a burden to them and draw undue attention to yourself. Don't do that. The context of this is very interesting. Remember the Christians in Thessalonica were newer believers and their zeal, it just abounded, especially it seems when it came to the return of Christ. But look, instead of that great hope leading them to zeal and passion in the growing sanctified life, it instead led to a restlessness that wasn't good for them. See, it seems that this was all that they thought about, really. That this had become a, uh, the, the center of their excited interest, so much so that it led them to even neglect their daily duties. In other words, they were in anticipation of the coming of Christ at such a fever pitch that they began to allow the mundane responsibilities of life to lose its importance. But guess what? Those mundane things are all so important. You kind of understand what they were dealing with? Jesus is coming at any minute, we believe. That was their thought. So why make the house payment? Jesus is coming, so why mess around with all these worldly issues like showering and brushing my teeth or shaving? How good would that be? Let's go and get our pajamas on and let's go out on the rooftop and wait because we know that he's coming back real soon. And it seemed that they lost all sense of responsibility. Yes, they were anticipating him, and that's great. And how much more us today who are closer than anyone else in history has ever been. But instead of that anticipation leading them to the growing sanctified life, to sharing their faith, to drawing near to God, to fighting sin with more fervor, to staying in the Word, and to staying in prayer like it should have, it instead led them to neglecting normal duties of life. So Paul addresses that here, lead a quiet life, a calm life, a restful life, a peaceful life, so that instead of succumbing to fanatical excitement, they're to have a biblical balanced outlook on life. The call is to lead peaceful lives, free of conflict and free of hostility to others, which will then serve as a witness to the transforming power of the gospel, the good news of Christ. So the call was for them to be less frantic, not less exuberant. Keep the zeal, but express that zeal in a God-honoring way. One noted, the call here is for Christians to live quiet, relaxed, restful, peaceful lives in the face of persecution, and also in face of the anticipation of the Lord's return. And that's absolutely right. Paul uses a similar phrase in 1 Timothy 2.2 where he says that we should pray for kings and all who are in authority. Why? So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. The goal in this is to be a godly witness through behavior that demonstrates contentment and peace in Christ. Right? We trust Him. We are at peace. Chill out. Trust God. Glorify God right where He has you and lead a steady, sober, useful life that calls attention not to yourself, but to the Lord who saves. Third, mind your own business, verse 11. These two things really go together. The quiet life and minding your own business, they go together. In other words, stop meddling. Keep your nose out of the affairs of other people and deal with things that you yourself need to deal with. The word for mind here means to be occupied with and to practice. And the call is for Christians to be making it their daily practice and lifestyle to take care of their own business. And then it's also a warning against meddling in the affairs of others in an ungodly way. Yes, we need to love each other. Yes, we need to care for each other. Yes, we need to have a proper concern for the needs of the brethren within the the body of Christ, of course. But don't be a busybody. And don't neglect your own duties. Paul deals with this in 2 Thessalonians 3.11 when he says this, We hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but you're acting like busybodies. So, don't do that. Don't get into somebody else's personal affairs. Just stay out of that if you can. I mean, don't don't we all have enough of our own business to concern ourselves with? Anybody? Right? So, 
Take care of your own business. Concentrate on your own life. Concentrate on how you live. Stay out of other people's matters. Stay out of other people's issues. And again, yes, minister to and encourage one another, but please be sure that you don't act like busybodies where you just run around and stick your nose in everybody else's affairs. And then um, uh, for those that do that, gossip usually follows, right? It's not good. It's not good. No, mind your business. One said, lead a quiet unobtrusive, gentle, peaceful life, and make sure you give yourself in sacrificial love to one another and in the matter of meeting needs. And that's, that's what Paul's saying there. Amen to that. Fourth, work hard with your hands as we commanded you, verse 11. It seems that there were a couple of different problems taking place at one time in this situation. First, there was a problem with people not working, right? Jesus is coming soon. Why work, right? Well, since they don't work, they can't earn a living, and that puts a strain on the life of the church. That said, they aren't just sitting at home. No, they're busybodies. They're, they're meddling in and worrying about areas that shouldn't be their concern. So mind your business and then work hard with your hands. Do Get busy. Get busy working for the glory of God. Now look, God created humans to work, right? The first instruction God gave Adam was to work, to tend the Garden of Eden. So work was given before sin entered the world, and therefore, it's a part of God's perfect creation. Work wasn't the result of the fall. Some of us might think that. It was not. The fall only made work more difficult. Tending Eden was designed to be a pleasant and rewarding job for Adam. He certainly would have loved caring for the garden, and he would have found it fulfilling. He would have found it purposeful because work was designed to do that. See, work is the way to provide for our basic needs and to help others who may be unable to work for various reasons. So we should embrace the work that God has given us to do, and we should express gratitude to Him that we have the ability to provide for ourselves and to provide for our families. As Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do your work heartily and for the Lord rather than for men. So work hard and for the Lord. See, laziness, which is the avoidance of work, is condemned in Scripture. People who neglect to provide for their families were condemned by the early church, 1 Timothy 5.8. Paul gave instructions to those who refused to work that they shouldn't be allowed to eat, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Jesus himself worked, and so work was designed by God as man's earthly occupation, which is a very good thing. So work hard, exalt Christ, do good, Work with your hands, even if that means that you sit at a desk all day and do it well for the glory of God. It's quite an issue today. People don't want to work, right? People don't want to work. What happens to uh, people when they don't have to go to work? They sit around doing nothing, pretty much, right? They, They get depressed. They get up late. They watch TV all day. They meddle in the affairs of other people. They play video games all day and all night, or they waste their time on many other things, and they lose a sense of purpose in their lives. Note note that not every job is a paid job, okay? So please understand that. Stay-at-home moms work very, very, very hard, right? I know some retired people who work very hard every day doing things to bless God and others. That's all very good because God made us for work and so it's a good thing. So I hope you understand what Paul is saying here. Christianity has always stood for the dignity of work and labor while the godless are characterized by slackness and laziness and laziness isn't good. One said, our idle days are Satan's busy days. Another, our footprints in the sands of time are never made by sitting down. Another, there's never yet been a person in our history who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. And then Spurgeon, it's an abomination to let the grass grow up to your knees and to do nothing toward making it into hay. God never sent a man into the world to be idle. That's right. Instead, work hard, whatever your lot is, work hard. To make money and survive, absolutely, so that you can mind your own business and and not meddle in the affairs of others, that too, and then for your own good. And look, even if Jesus is returning tomorrow, work hard. One pastor said it like this, the Christian church is no place for a lack of love. It's no place for a loud, boisterous people who are involved in all kinds of things that they shouldn't be involved in. No, back off. 
Live a quiet life, a peaceful life. Stay out of the public eye when possible. Mind your own business. Work with your hands. Glorify God where he has you and keep living your life day by day for the glory of God and the unbelievers around you will see it. That's right. That leads to the next point. Fifth, walk properly toward those who are outside. Verse 12. And that ties in with working hard with your own hands. Those who are outside are the unsaved. And look, when you live the kind of life that Paul lays out here for us well, that is a great witness to the lost world around us. What does real evangelism consist of? It consists of a lifestyle that exalts Christ in our lives. The key to evangelism is the integrity of the lives of Christians who show the troubled, purposeless, messed up world a lifestyle that's filled with love and peace and purpose and calmness and and hard work and look when christians live that kind of life in this chaotic world people will then see the difference everything everything's stirred up and everything's troubled and, and you're at peace there's anger and hostility and hatred and you're filled with this astounding otherworldly love Everyone's all stirred up by the headlines, feeding off the lives of those in Hollywood and feeding off the lives of those around them. And you're faithfully minding your own business, glorifying God in the midst of all of it. And everyone at work is doing as little as they possibly can just to get by, cutting corners, cheating on the time clock, slacking off whenever they can So when no one's looking. And here you are, working hard because you're a Christian and ultimately because you know that God is watching and you're doing it for the glory of God. What's the deal with you? See how it works? Christ. Christ makes all the difference. And he's the, this is the primary means of drawing people to the Lord. Does this mean that we never say anything about the Lord, that we just live it out and never speak up? No, of course not. Of course we speak up, but we do that in the context of this loving, increasing, peaceable, Christ-like lifestyle, see? And the first aim is for the glory and pleasure of God. That's why we do this. But then after that is that those who are outside will see Christ in us and respond to it. So the Great Commission is clearly in view here as Paul writes these words and good news, right? Here's the good news. We can have an impact on the lost around us and we must. So don't be obnoxious. Don't be unloving. Don't be a busybody, a bad worker, lazy, rude. No, don't do that. Faithfully glorify the Lord where he has you and shine his light where he has you. And good news, God can use us to impact the lost around us and be the means of saving their souls from eternal wrath. So I say, let's get on with that. Think about this. There are over 8 billion people in the world. Around 166,000 souls die in the world every day. That's almost 7,000 souls every hour, 116 souls every minute, and nearly two souls every second dying nonstop. And most of those people don't know the Lord. Most of those people are dying in their sin and they're going to hell. Think about it. Hordes of people in Myanmar are dying in their sin every day. Masses of people in Spain and Africa and the Philippines don't have the hope that comes through Jesus Christ alone. Tons of people here in Vacaville are hopeless, lost, and wandering about like sheep without a shepherd. And look, God put us here for a reason, and woe to us if we don't sound forth the word of truth, the good news of Christ to the lost souls around us faithfully and passionately. I mean, how could we not do that? in light of everything that he's done for us. One noted, sinners are dying in the streets by hundreds. Men are sinking into the flames of eternal wrath, but many Christians fold their arms. They pity the poor, perishing sinner, but they do nothing to show that their pity is real. Lord, help us here to show that our pity is real. Lord, help us to blow the trumpet of God loudly into the ears of those around us. Lord, help us to fulfill our responsibility and calling by God. Lord, help us to sound forth the good news of Christ boldly, loudly, clearly, unapologetically, and passionately, day by day, in the workplace, faithfully being who we are, living out our faith, and then sharing our faith lovingly to those around us. Hey, 
Why are you so loving? Why do you work so hard? Why, why are you so peaceable in, and, and, and steady in this messed up, mixed up world? Jesus. He changes everything, right? He saved my soul. He forgave me of all my sin. He gave me peace. He gave me purpose. He changed everything. And good news, he can change you too and save your soul from eternal wrath. See? See how it works? So bad news first, we're all sinners and sin has serious wages, death. That means that either you die and pay the price for your own sin for all eternity in hell since sin committed against a holy, eternal, and infinite God is worthy of eternal and infinite wages or else someone who is truly worthy and able comes along and pays that incredibly high and costly price for you in your place as your substitute. But who? Who can do it? Who is worthy? And then who would be willing to do that for me? Anybody? Anybody? Jesus, only one who's willing and able, Jesus Christ. He alone could pay the asking price for your soul, and that's exactly what he did. As John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And how good is that? Think about this. Jesus, God the Son, left heaven, came here, took on human flesh, lived a perfect life, died on the cross in the believer's place as our substitute for sin, and then he rose up from the dead three days later, and that means everything that matters for those of us who believe. That although we have sinned against God and deserve his eternal judgment, look, because of his great love and undeserved mercy, he sent his own son to bear the penalty that we as believers deserve. Jesus paid our wages of death and hell on that cross so that we who believe could then be declared righteous and right with the Lord God Almighty. Jesus paid our eternal debt so that we who believe in true, saving, repentant faith can be forgiven of all our sin that condemns us and go to heaven instead of hell. And that is the best news in the history of the world. And now, for all who believe, forgiven saved, cleansed, heaven instead of hell. Purpose, meaning that truly matters. What do you say? See how it works? So live in love, increase more and more, live a quiet and peaceful life, mind your own business, work hard for the glory of God and let that all be the means of impacting the lost around you for that's how God brings the lost to saving faith in Christ through us. Through us. What a privilege. What an honor. Six, lack nothing. The end of verse 13. That you may lack nothing. Okay, what does that mean? It means that we should be responsible managers of our income. Paying our bills, living within our means, being generous and ready to share with others and not being dependent on the government or on anyone else because we're lazy or because we are trying to take advantage of the system. It's all... Very practical here. Christians are not a burden. No, we are a blessing. Christians aren't bad citizens. No, we're the best citizens. Christians aren't troublemakers. No, we are peacemakers, unless, of course, trouble comes because we're glorifying and honoring Christ, but, but only then. Christians live simply and generously. We love, we give, we mind our own business, and we're a bright light in a dark world. And again, it's all very practical. This is what we do until Christ returns for us, or until we go to be with him. It's all very practical. When COVID hit, we had an opportunity as a church to get free money. Ooh. The government, remember? The government was offering loans out to businesses and to churches that you could take, and you wouldn't have to pay it back. Free money. That said, we obviously said no to this because it's someone's money. We just thought what a bad witness it would have been to take money, first of all, that we didn't really need, let alone what a bad witness it would have been to take money from the government, even if we did need it. They can't even take care of themselves. They need the government to bail them out. <laughs> I know there are a number of churches that took these loans. I, I think it's a bad witness. 
heard about a number of ministries that took out these loans, and the leader of those ministries suddenly ended up with a new high-end car, a new Rolex watch, and so on. Bad witness. Paul wants us to lack nothing, to not be a burden, but to be a blessing. Simple, yet very profound in a pagan society. What then is the call? To live in love. To be clear who you are in Christ. When you do that, the outside world will clearly see Christ in us. In the city of Thessalonica, everyone would have noticed the changed lives in these Christians very, very clearly. They didn't participate in the religious ceremonies and the sexual immorality in the pagan temples around them. They didn't cheat each other or anyone for that matter. They worked hard. They took care of each other. They loved each other. And if you want your faith to be evident to those around you, and you should, then Paul says to live in this simple yet profound way, a way that reflects the love of Christ to other people day by day. In the mundane things of this fading life, faithfully and to the end, whenever that may come. Lord, help us to do that here. Next week, we're going to have fun having an overview of prophecy. See you next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for your wonderful word of truth, for Paul's very, very practical words For the Thessalonians and for us in Christ today, I pray that we would examine ourselves. I pray that we would heed these words and that we would be known as the church that that loves, loves you and loves others. Never, ever compromising your truth, but loving well for your glory, the way you command, the way it ought to be. Bless us. May we glorify you well in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.